uh, I got to tell you that I went out and bought the album a couple of weeks ago. Oh, heck yeah. And uh, it's definitely my favorite album of the year. And uh, so I went down, walked down to the record store down the street and the, uh, told the, ordered it from the guy and uh, he, he called me up and he got it, got the record and he's been listening to it ever since as well. Now it's his favorite record. As well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. We're doing I'm it one not. at a time. <laughs> I'll take it how I can get it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's a fantastic record. And especially with all the stuff that's going on in the States. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tell me how you feel about that and how, you know, as far as how it relates to you and the record. I wish I could say that uh, uh, I was prophetic enough to know this was coming and that I was going to write about it, but uh, I was not. I, I was writing about where we were a year ago, um, right. kind of the divisiveness of our country, um, and then throw a global pandemic and an election year on top of that. And, uh, this record uh, became all too timely, uh, yeah. way too, way too quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's one of those records that I was hoping would, would would mature and we would see, we wouldn't see it come to fruition. We wouldn't see right. some of these things happen. Um, but here we are, uh, two months at, less than two months after the record comes out, uh, and it almost seems as if I was writing about the current times. Yeah, um, it's it's a good feeling as a songwriter to know that you wrote something that was relevant, but it's also yeah. a weird feeling knowing that these songs kind of are talking about the worst possible scenario. And here we are in the worst possible scenario. I understand. Yeah. Are yeah. you in uh, North Carolina now? Yeah. Yeah. This is where I'm based. Um, you know, a lot of people move to, you know, Nashville or Austin or New York. And I was right. born in, I was born in North Carolina. Uh, I went to school in North Carolina, and so uh, it only made sense for me to try to build my music career um, out of the state that I was born in. Uh, right, so right. I'm still in Raleigh. Um, been here for 18 years now, which is crazy to think. Uh, I spent right. 18 years in my hometown of Reedsville, North Carolina, and now 18 years here in Raleigh. So I, I guess next year this will be the place I've lived the longest in my life. So. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... And, and what's the vibe like on the street in, in Raleigh? Uh, I wouldn't know. I don't really leave the house. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of those uh, people that listen to science uh, right? doctors. Um, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't listen to, uh, you know, Facebook uh, yep. medicine experts uh, that I went to high school with um, that also own uh, landscaping services. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You know, it's I I I I take it serious, and me and my wife, uh, and I have a two-year-old daughter. Right. Uh, you know, my father's sixty-five. Uh, I don't want to be the cause of any problem. Right, right. So I, I hear you. If, if the price that I have to pay is me staying inside of my house and spending time with my family, uh, there's worse. There's worse things to pay for for safety. Well, I can tell you from experience here in New Zealand, it works because. Oh. I'm Pretty so much jealous. the whole country just locked down for two months and we beat it. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so jealous. Like I see the I see the I see the photos and the videos uh you know of the of the soccer match that everybody got to go to just you know post, you know, we beat this thing, yay. Yeah. And here we here we are and we're and we're seeing we haven't seen a decline. It's it's just Yeah, I know. Numbers keep going up and nobody seems to care. Like we're the only country who thinks that us being inconvenienced was the end of a pandemic. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> like how, how, how conceited uh, and selfish can a country be to where, you know, everybody else in the world is being affected by this and handling it properly. And yeah. then we're just like, you know what? We, we tried for 10 weeks. Let's just, uh, let's just chalk it up to uh, this isn't going to happen. Well, sadly it's, it really looks like it's just lack of leadership, you know, that, Somebody needs to take us. <laughs> us. <laughs> Lack of leadership in the United uh, States. That's that. That's blasphemous. That, yeah, that, know, there's know, no know. way <laughs> that we could let that happen. You know. It's, uh, yeah. There's there's a severe lack of leadership. Uh, yeah. And there's a severe lack of accountability um, from that leadership. And uh, here we are. You know, yes, everybody. 
you know, I, there, it's sad when people, the optimistic people I know who are like, well, we, you know, I, I didn't think we'd make it three and a half years. You know, here we are three and a half years into this thing and it's further yeah. than I thought we'd make it with his presidency. Um, yeah. But I, re I really do think, uh, you know, his base has always been um, who they are. Yeah. Uh, and, but I think that this whole, the last six months really kind of show the true colors of people. This is um, true you realize that it's not about politics anymore. It's not about fiscal responsibility or tax allocation or social programs. It's about good people versus bad people. It's yeah. about, it's about people that believe in a better humanity uh, and giving people equal chances at succeeding in life and not just about the status quo that this country was built on, you know, yeah. Expe especially being a Southerner here in yeah. America. Um, it's hard to look at, previous generations and the missteps that they took uh, and admit it and admit that people that you love, people that brought your grandparents into the world, that brought your parents, that brought you into the world might've been bad people might've yeah, been yeah. standing up for the wrong side of history. That's a hard thing to look in the mirror and admit. Um, but there's a lot of young Southerners like myself that are willing to do that, that are willing to say, okay, Let's look at history, see what not to repeat, and let's just try to be better people. Uh, but then you have people that either, you know, are completely okay with being racist, homophobic, misogynistic, xenophobes, uh, <laughs> or, or at least it's not a deal breaker. For right, them. exactly. Um, you know, so, yeah, yeah, and, you know, here in the South, we get the, uh, we get the, uh, you know, the stereotype of being dumb and uneducated. We talk slow. Uh, our words drag out. Um, but, you know, the most the, the, the only thing more dangerous than a dumb Southern person is an educated Southern person because <laughs> okay. we come, you know, when you meet us, you might think that you have the upper hand, but it's, we actually know, like some of us are actually educated and we read books and we right. like to <laughs> learn from mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm from, I'm originally from, Pennsylvania and New York state. So yeah, I understand nice. where you're coming from. <laughs> and yeah. I lived briefly in Florida and uh, we, we, my, won't, we won't, we won't hold that against you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, but, um, and I'm curious, uh, I, like you said, the album has been out for two months now and, but you've been in kind of isolation. Have you gotten much feedback from people about what you were writing about and how you're approaching these things? Yeah. Um, so, we put the record out on May 1st, um, which is weird because that's smack in the middle of, that was even when Americans were quarantining. Right. Um, that was, that was when it was still a very serious thing. So there's no handbook for releasing new music in the middle of a pandemic. You, you have no idea if it's even going to be received by people. Um, you have no idea who's going to listen to it. Um, but what we learned is when you lock people up for eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, they become hungry for new art, yeah. uh, especially when nothing is being created. Um, so luckily for us, you know, we recorded this record in December. Here we are sitting on a piece of brand new art. Um, you, you're given the decision to, to, to go ahead and put it out on your release day or push it until the fall when you hope that you can tour behind it. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we chose... Um, the former, just because um, we thought it was important to get it out into the world. We believed in the record and we thought that the record didn't need any fancy marketing gimmicks or a big tour to push the song. We, we really felt like the song stood on their own feet um, and we put it out into the world. And, and luckily for us, uh, at least in my experience, we were correct. Um, people have really gravitated toward this record. Um, Long time American Aquarium fans. Uh, find that it nestles right into our catalog pretty well. Uh, and we brought a lot of new people to the table with this record. A lot of people who had either never heard of us, never given us the chance, or maybe listened to me on my like third record when I was still trying to find my feet as a songwriter. Right. Uh, and, and came back and said, wow, this kid really grew into a, a real songwriter. Like, yeah, uh, you, well, you definitely have. I mean, no, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> there's some amazing songs on this record. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of one of those people that was aware of the band, but never paid that much attention until for some reason this record. And so then I went back and listened to some of the older stuff and it all makes sense now. But, but yeah, yeah, it's, we're, we're a great band. Some people come out of the gate really, really great. Uh, John Prine, uh, Guy Clark, yeah. uh, Isbel out of the gate with yeah. the truckers. 
Um, those are called unicorns. Those people don't <laughs> exist in the real world. Um, nobody comes out for their first debut record and writes John Prine's solo record. Like his, yeah. his solo debut, nobody should have a greatest hits as a debut record. Like that's not fair to the rest of us trying to put words on paper. Um, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, but guys like me who have been doing it for 15 years, you can, uh, it's fun because, you know, during this quarantine, I've actually listened back and kind of dug back through my old catalog, searching for wow. some of those gems um, that I wrote off as just kind of novice youth. Right, um, right. Uh, but it's fun to watch the progression. It's fun to watch a craft. Um, it's like watching somebody build cabinets or build houses. Um, their first ones are going to be pretty bad and their second ones aren't going to be as bad as the ones before it. And then right. so on and so forth. <laughs> um, and I'm finally feeling like I'm getting to a point in my career, um, where I understand, uh, how songs function. Right. And I under, I understand what my voice is, which was really hard for a lot of people to find, mm -hmm. um, because you spend so much time of your youth, your, your first couple of records are these amalgamations of, of all your influences and you're trying right. to find, you know, Art is just one of these things where you take everything that you've been surrounded by and you pluck the pieces that mean the most to you and then you try to make that your voice. Yeah. You know, we're, this is our eighth record, eight full studio record as a band. And I feel like I finally, um, not only wearing my influences on my sleeve, but also finding my own yeah. spot to stand up and say something. And, and yeah, a way you, can that, definitely, you can definitely hear, you know, some Tom Petty, some, you know, Dylan or uh, Neil or whatever in there, but it's not like you're aping them or anything. It's, you have your own voice at this point. Yeah, if you want to hear me ripping off Springsteen and Petty, listen to the first two or three records. Uh, okay. it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's me knowing the kind of music that moves me, knowing the kind of narrative storytelling that moves me, knowing the kind of songwriter fronting a really great rock and roll band yeah. moves me. Yeah. Uh, and then the last couple of records, you're finding, um, you know, somebody who, who can tip the hat and not fully ape them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned a rock and roll band. Really, even though the band has been around for many years, there's a lot of new members this time around. Uh, you kind of revamped the whole band last year, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm pushing uh, close to 40 members that have been in this band <laughs> in, in 15 years. So to, uh, to say that turnover has been tumultuous is a severe understatement. Right, um, right. It's a, uh, I've had a lot of band members, um, but the newest version of the band has been here a little over a year now. Uh, they're the record, uh, they're the band that I made the record with back in December. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, they're not going anywhere. Right. Um, they're, uh, they're, you know, every time you replace a band member, you're hoping to take a step forward and replace them with someone with more experience or more talent or more just drive, overall drive. Uh, and I feel like I've really hit my stride as far as the people that I've surrounded myself with to make music. Um, because not all, everybody I've surrounded myself with has, has been talented. Um, I, I think at a certain point, you're able to pull in talented people. But finding talented people that really love serving the song as much as you do, that's mm -hmm. the hard part. Um, finding a good guitar player is easy. Finding right. a guy that can just solo uh, the whole <laughs> time is really easy. Um, finding a guy that has restraint, finding your version of Mike Campbell, finding right. a guy that can sit back and just play the same couple notes and make this really iconic lead line. Uh, but if you look at him and say, okay, cut loose, they can cut loose. <laughs> right. um, you know, like, like my favorite stuff is that Mike Campbell and, the, and some of that mud crutch stuff they released back in the mid two thousands. Right. That show that shows you just how good Mike yeah. Campbell really is at guitar. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's a really good, he's good at music. Um, <laughs> but you listen to a lot of those Tom Petty songs and they're very, very simple, almost beginner, but beginners could never come up with that. You yeah. know, it, 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 it's, it's somebody who is a student of the song. Uh, and that's what I found in my guitar player, Shane Baker. Um, he is, but he, he was, the, he's the only holdout from the things change band. Right. Um, so he's been with me for two records now. Um, he is one of the most phenomenal guitar players I've ever met, not just played with, but ever met. Um, he walks that line between bluesy lead stuff and atmospheric, uh, ambient stuff really, really well. Um, yeah. The way I got Shane was when I was rebuilding the band, I was talking to some friends. I told him I wanted a guitar player because before Shane, I had two guitar players. I had one lead player and one kind of uh, kind of set the mood atmospheric rhythm player. 
Yeah. Uh, and I, and I told my friend, I was like, I want one guy that can do both those jobs at the same time. <laughs> uh, and you know, you really think that it's going to be, you know, the white whale, you're not going to find that. And right. then, you know, out of Austin, Texas, Shane Baker. Um, and well, it's been, a good place to look for musicians. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's way worse places to try to pluck a white whale. Um, uh, guitar player, but uh, Shane's been great. He's been with me for a while. But this new band, um, you know, Red uh, Red Huffman, uh, yeah. Neil Jones, Ryan Van Fleet, Alden Hedges, um, all just amazing players. Uh, and and we had fun making a record. It didn't feel like work. It didn't feel strenuous. Uh, it was a uh, one of those kind of uh, striking lightning. You know, it's putting yeah. lightning in a bottle. And uh, and for ten days, we made a a really cool record. It took 10 uh, days, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, it took eight days. Two of the day, one of the days was setting up and one of the days was breaking down, but I still paid for those days. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, we, we cut that record in eight days. Uh, all Man. the basic tracks were done in four days. So we, we, we went in, we were average about four songs a day uh, when we got in. Um, and then obviously a song like Me and Mine took uh, an entire 15 hour day. Right, um, right. To, to build into this. Uh, mountain of an opening track that is a good way to describe it it does build up and it does hit you <laughs> by the time you're done you're just like whoa what was that yes yeah, some people you, you, the, a song like that can only go in two places on record it can be a closer or it can be an opener and most people i'd say nine out of ten people would choose to make that a closer yeah um we went the opposite we decided that we wanted to punch people in the mouth from the front like I imagined someone who had never, uh, you, I imagine you listening to the record. I imagine someone who had never listened to the band, putting that on, it starting as a folk song and then turning into almost a Wilco Sky yeah. Blue Sky jam. Yeah. And I imagine that song ending after seven and a half minutes and the listener saying, what's next? Like, <laughs> what? what? Yeah. Like, if that's the opener. Yep. Where, like, a, like an almost an eight minute rock opus uh where where do we go from here and that yeah. was what and that was the intended effect that was that was very uh willingly put at the front of the record just because we wanted to sucker punch people we wanted I people see. to let them we wanted to let people know that this was not a normal american aquarium record this was not a normal uh americana record yeah yeah because it's almost like you've built it the opposite way you would think the songs at the end of the record are kind of like the ones that would more likely be singles uh, the long haul and a better South and, you know, did you look at it that way or? Yeah. Well, well I, the long haul was definitely a purposeful, uh, placement. Um, yeah. I, the record, um, for those that are unaware of the record, um, the record is an extremely dark look, uh, at the American landscape, um, yeah. especially politically and socially. Um, and I didn't want the last song of the record to be like a dirge. I didn't want it to be just, uh, just, you know, another four minutes of negativity. I wanted to leave the listener on a hopeful note. I wanted to leave the listener on an uptick. I wanted the last thing that you heard almost a rally cry of no matter how many times we fall down, you've got to get back up and stick with it. Yeah. Um, you know, this great American experiment that we're currently in. Um, it's it's one of those and it can be and, it, and i apply it to three things in my life i apply it to uh my tumultuous uh band member uh departures i depart I, I apply it to my sobriety and i apply it to my relationship with my wife mm -hmm. uh and so those are three things where i have fell down uh, and instead of quitting um got back up uh and worked to make it better um mm -hmm. and so i wanted to leave the, the listener with that kind of uh message instead of let's say a me and mine or, uh, you know, a day I learned a lot of you or, you know, six years come September. I didn't want to leave it with a really yeah. sad, depressing message. Yeah. I wanted to leave it with, you know, pull yourself up and go get them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what kind of reaction have you gotten to the song, a better South? Because that's, <laughs> I just wonder, you know, maybe it's yeah. good that you're in isolation. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, when you, when you call yourself a country band, and I think at the root of it, we are a country band. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of traditionalists will argue that we're not. Um, we're a little too rock for uh, your traditional country people. We're not uh, pretty enough to be on the radio. Um, but uh, at the root of it, we tell stories. Um, and that's what country music is. Country music mm -hmm. is an honest interpretation uh, of, of life. 
and uh, anything on an acoustic guitar uh, and a guy telling you a story in three verses in a chorus is country music. I don't care how you church it up or what, uh, right. what all encompassing umbrella you put it under, like Americana. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's country music at its root. And, this is true. Um, when you release a song like that, um, that, that is a, a self-reflective look in the mirror of where the South is and where it was and where it could be. Um, you know, this is coming from progressive Southerner who is, who is uh, the drive-by truckers had a really great way of describing the duality of the Southern thing. Um, it's about loving where you're from right. and also hating some of the things that where you're from created. Yep. Um, so it's about like, for me, uh, two of the greatest things in this entire world come from the South, music and food. Mm -hmm. There is nobody in the entire world that does food or music better than Southern people. I will argue that until the day I die. <laughs> um, I love that about the South, but yeah. I also hate kind of, I talk about it in the song, that kind of shadow, the yeah. original sin of America that took place in the South. Um, what our country, what our, what our, the South was built on, what our economy was built on, uh, what our social structure was built on. It was built on hate uh, and taking advantage of people of color. And when you put that into a song and call it country music, uh, you're going to offend uh, some people uh, that, 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 that stand up and say that it's their history, that it's their heritage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not hate. It's who my great granddaddy was. And I hate to break it to those people, but the Confederacy lasted four and a half years. Four yeah. and a outcast lasted longer than the Confederacy. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, get out of here. That's, yeah. that, that's just an excuse, uh, for your closed mindedness and your hatred. Yeah, um, yeah. and so I wanted to put into a song that, you know, uh, the thing that I hear a lot when I, cause as you can probably tell by now, I'm very outspoken, uh, with the things that I believe in. Um, I'm told a lot that I need to shut up and sing. Uh, right. That's my favorite. I can imagine that. Is, yeah. It, is what is when people, I don't, I don't pay for your, uh, political opinions. I pay for you to sing songs. And I have to explain to them that if you expect me to be open and honest and transparent about my personal life, about my relationships, about my inner band relationships, about my addiction, about sobriety, about the road, but then I can't talk about that one glaring thing that stares us in the face every single morning when we wake up, yep. you don't want me to sing. You just want me to sing the stuff that you agree with. And that's, yep. Not yep. How, and that's not how this works. You're paying me as an artist to be observant and then translate my observations into three verses in a chorus that can make you understand said observation. Uh, so telling me to shut up and saying is telling me like, Hey, only do half your job. <laughs> right. You know? yeah. um, and nobody is ever going to tell you to shut up and sing if you're echoing their sentiment. Right. Um, the only reason that somebody tells you to shut up and sing is because they have a dissenting view than you do. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I'm not going to tolerate that. Uh, uh, I've, I've ran off a lot of people, but at the same time, I've brought a lot of people into the fold right? Uh, because I'm not willing, uh, I will let it affect my bottom line. Uh, that's why a lot of country artists don't speak out about what's going on in our country right now is because they realize from an economic standpoint that half their crowd might lean left and half their crowd might lean right. And if they take a stand, they're going to run off $15 a record, $50 a show, and it starts affecting your bottom line. I'm at a point where I'm not selling out amphitheaters. I don't care if I lose 20 racist assholes on Twitter. Um, <laughs> that's, that, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, right. I'll, I'll, at the end of the day, and I only started getting political a few years ago in my songs. One, because 2016 happened. Yeah. Uh, and then I had a daughter uh, uh, a couple months later. And uh, well, in 2018, I had a daughter. And I, and, I, and I decided that I never wanted my daughter um, to look at me and ask me why I didn't speak up about things that were important. Yeah. Um, I, I never want her to look back in history lessons and see the 2016 election or what has transpired since and said, Dad, you had a, a platform to say something yep. and you didn't. I never want my daughter to look at me like a coward because right. I, wanted, I wanted a couple extra bucks in my pocket or I wanted a couple extra likes on Facebook. Right, right. Um, I want her to look at me and be like, my dad used every possible thing he could to stand up for the things that he believed in. Um, and if that's the legacy that kid has of me, a okay with it. Yeah, I'll, there you I'll, go. I'll, I'll, I'll hand back that ticket money and those album sales. As long as I can look that kid in the eye and know she respects that her dad stood up for something. That's, that's the most important thing for me.